It's been a few months since the last time I did one of my studio tours where I cover, you know, a lot of the equipment that I've purchased in the last four years since starting the YouTube channel. So today I wanted to do an uh, updated one of these studio tours because people have been asking about it and I have bought a lot of new equipment in the last few months since the last time I did one of these types of videos. And, you know, people are interested because, my, of course, a lot of folks are interested in just the equipment I use to run Linux on a daily basis, like new to Linux users want to know, hey, what kind of computer equipment do you use and things like that. And many people are asking because they're interested in making video content or sometimes audio content. They want to know about the audio equipment, the video equipment. So today I'm going to cover all of that stuff. So I think the very first place to start, would, let's just briefly cover the computers that are in this room because uh, many people ask this all the time. So I have a triple monitor setup behind me for my main workstation. Those are not expensive monitors. Those are, I bought them about six months ago. They are AOC brand monitors. They're 24 and a half inch monitors. I've got a triple monitor mount from Wally that is that the monitors are mounted to. Now the triple monitor mount I bought was the kind of mount that you could either mount to the back of a disc or you could drill a hole in the center of a disc. The problem is that disc was like three foot wide, so it was actually way too deep for me to mount that Wally triple monitor mount all the way to the back of the disc. So what I did is I got my brother-in-law to rig me up this nice wood U-shaped base that I then mounted the uh, Wally mount to. You can see the uh, Wally mount is actually drilled into the wood you frame and it's worked out quite nicely so that is the monitors i do have a fourth monitor in this room this is nothing special this is actually an old samsung uh, tv uh, very old but it is hdmi so it does plug nicely into a raspberry pi and that's what it's plugged into right now it's a raspberry pi 4 that's running manjaro's arm edition and uh, i just keep a, a raspberry pi around just in case i ever need to play with anything Pi related. I actually have a Pi 3 and the Pi 4 that's currently running right there. Now my main production workstation is this very large tower right here. And this tower, that is a, a Threadripper 1920X. That is a 12 thread, 20, I thought, sorry, a 12 core 24 thread Threadripper in that. It's got 64 gigs of RAM. The graphics card is a Radeon 7 and the motherboard is a, uh, I believe it's an ASRock brand motherboard. Not sure of the model number on that, but uh, you know, it's plenty of workstation for what I do making video content. Having a 24 thread CPU is really nice for video editing, video rendering. Having 64 gigs of RAM comes in handy as well because video editing, especially, you know, your video editors can actually use up that RAM. So you can give it as much RAM as you want, as much as you could afford. I could only afford 64 gigs of RAM at the time when I bought that machine. That machine now is about not two and a half, three years old. Uh, some of the other stuff on the desk here, you guys often ask about keyboards and mice. Let me get that in frame there. That is the ZSA Moonlander, a very nice keyboard. And next to it is my mouse, which is a Kensington Expert. So that's a trackball mouse. Uh, I really love the Kensington Expert. So I've bought two of them, one for the office and one for home because uh, since moving to the trackball, I really don't like using standard mice anymore. So I've got two of those. The Moonlander I've got here at my workstation. Now, before I bought the Moonlander, I also bought a ZSA uh, ErgoDox Easy. And that is another ergonomic split keyboard, very similar to the Moonlander. That is at my home. I use that for my home computer. And then I also have a... Uh, Easy Plank from ZSA. So this is well one of these, uh, let's see if I can get that in frame there. That is a 47 key keyboard. And I, I use that right now. I've just got that plugged into the Raspberry Pi because I didn't have a, a keyboard or a mouse for the Pi. So I'm using the Easy Plank there for the Pi and the uh, mouse is just a cheap Logitech. I, um, the kind of cheap Logitech mice you get for free when you buy a computer. <laughs> you know, they usually throw in a cheap, one of these cheap Logitech mice. I've got three or four of them in a drawer that I keep around just in case I need to use them. Of course, these days, again, I prefer using the trackball. Let's talk about speakers because people have asked about that 
and my speakers here i don't know if i can get that in frame here give me just a second this little tweeter here now that is a logitech z313 so you have two of the little smaller tweeters and then it has a subwoofer box that is in the back of the computer that these wires are currently sitting on and those are very nice speakers from logitech again the brand is z13 and uh, I use them mainly for monitoring audio while I'm editing video because, again, the sound quality on those speakers is really nice. Now, I also have a much cheaper set of Logitech speakers that if I get in frame here, you know, they're just laying on their sides. This is actually an Insignia brand speaker uh, that I bought probably eight, ten years ago. Very cheap speakers. I keep them around because they are uh, convenient because they have a, a plug, a headphone jack in the front of the speakers that has a knob that allows you to adjust the headphone volume. And that is something that I really need anytime I live stream because I have to wear headphones or earbuds while live streaming. Otherwise, you'll get audio feedback in the microphone. So uh, where the uh, monitoring speakers, the really nice pair of speakers I have, the Z13s, they don't actually have a headphone jack in the speakers, no knob or anything that I could control headphones with. So I'd have to do all that using Pulse Audio volume control if I use those speakers. And it's just messy, especially while live streaming, adjusting volume with the uh, Pulse Audio volume control. I don't like that. So I keep that cheap pair of speakers around and I plug those in just when I live stream, just to plug in headphones. Now, uh, some of the other stuff here on the desk, let's talk about lighting. One of the most common questions I get is lighting. Now, right here on my desk, I do have one of these Elgato key lights, and these are quite nice. Let me turn that on. These are really, really bright. Uh, I mean, they, they're adjustable settings, but this is the dimmest setting. This is about 10%. And as you can see, that's quite a bit of light. Like if I turned off the lights and that was the only thing shining on me, it would be like a spotlight, boom, just on me, right? 10%. If I put that thing up to 100%, it puts out a ton of light. The Elgato Key Light, very popular among video content creators and very popular, especially among live streamers. You see a lot of YouTube streamers and Twitch streamers that use the Elgato Key Light. And the cool thing with it is it has software that controls the dimness and color temperature and everything. It's Windows only software, though it doesn't work on Linux, but they do have mobile apps. So they do have an Android app so I can control it with my phone. I have an Android phone. I have a Samsung Galaxy 10 phone. So that is one of the lights. And typically I have this light on about 10% and pointed away from me usually slightly off toward the back of the wall to illuminate the back of the wall, which otherwise in my videos would have no illumination. And, you know, typically when you're trying to capture yourself on camera, the best thing you can do is to illuminate the stuff behind you because then that really makes you stand out, pop out. So that's kind of what I use the Elgato key light for. But my main lighting is the soft boxes here. This is a Favotech uh, LED panel. And I've got a soft box on it and it's got adjustable controls. It's got two knobs and the two knobs control the brightness. So you can adjust from zero to hundred percent. And it also adjusts the color temperature from, you know, very white to a more daylight, you know, yellowish color. And typically, you know, on video kind of content, if you want a, a natural kind of color, typically you want to set the color temperature to about 5,500 uh, you know, 55K is typically what you want. But, you know, if I if I err on one side of 55K, typically I'll go more toward the white side than the yellow side because uh, on my cameras anyway, I can, I tend to get very yellow. So uh, I can, I can correct that a little bit with these Favitech soft boxes by turning them to more of a white color balance. And of course, I've got two of the Favitechs and I've got them mounted on these stands, these rolling C stands here. So you can see it's got three foot or three feet, not three foot, but I've got the three rolling feet here and I've got sandbags on them because if I don't sandbag the feet, you know, once I put heavy equipment like these lighting that has some forward weight, you know, the rolling stands could uh, topple over. The other rolling stand I have 
the Fava Tech, and then of course I have uh, camera equipment and microphones and the various cables needed to plug in camera and microphone. You can see I've got a tripod with a shotgun mic. And this particular setup here, when I did my last Haiti ET, I was using that stand. What I do is I sit in my chair and then I roll that stand here about two feet in front of me, right? And then I've got the camera, I've got the lighting that's shining on me. I've got the shotgun mic with a tripod to get it up high, just out of camera frame. And that's what I did the last Haiti ET on. I'll, I'll try to roll some footage of uh, how that camera looks uh, on uh, this video. Now that camera is the first camera I bought for this channel as far as an actual camera, not just a standard webcam. That is a Panasonic Lumix G7. And the uh, lens on it right now is a 14 millimeter lens, so it gets a really wide shot. And you can tell on that last Hey DT, that 14 millimeter lens, even though it was only about three foot away from me, it looks like it's a million miles away from me, right? Though so that's the 14 millimeter lens on the Panasonic G7. Now, a newer camera I bought about a month ago, although I don't think I've told you guys, but if you've watched any of my standard videos where I'm sitting at my desk, all of those have been recorded on my new Panasonic G9, and the G9 sports a 25 millimeter lens, so not quite as wide, so it's a little bit tighter shot. You guys know the standard shot, probably, of me sitting in front of my three monitors, and typically what it gets in frame is the server rack the audio server rack is usually in the background and it's got some bokeh effect you know where the lighting it's kind of got that blurred effect and it looks really nice that is the benefits of that 25 millimeter lens it it has some really nice bokeh effects to it now we should talk about well, some of the pricing because I actually haven't priced anything that I've talked about. Let's talk about the cameras. So my old Panasonic G7 that I've used for the last three years, you can usually pick up just the Panasonic G7, the body, no lens or any extras. You can usually pick up a body for about $500. So not a terribly expensive camera, but definitely not cheap either. But for the price, it's a pretty good camera. I, 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 I'm really happy with the Panasonic G7. I'm glad I bought it. I've got a lot of, I mean, I've probably made nearly a thousand videos on the G7. The G9 cost a bit more being a newer camera. I want to say I paid about a thousand dollars, a thousand, maybe eleven hundred dollars for the, the G7. Uh, the differences between the, the G9 and the G7 one thing I don't like about the G9 is I've got the uh, the flip out uh, preview, right? But you can see that the cables that plug in this HDMI cable that I plug into my computer to capture the camera's video is in the way of the screen preview, which is kind of annoying. Now I'm not sitting here, typically when I'm recording, I'm not looking at the camera anyway, but every now and then I'll look up because I wanna see how I am in frame. And it's kind of annoying that that big HDMI cable is in the way where on the older model, the G7, uh, it has a mini HDMI plug-in instead of a standard HDMI plug-in, so much smaller cable, and it plugs in on the opposite side from where the preview window is. And I like that setup a lot more. And of course, I didn't start the YouTube channel with the Panasonic G7 or the Panasonic G9, which again, I've only had the G9 for about a month. I started the YouTube channel uh, using an old, Logitech C922 webcam. Let's see if I can get that in frame there. It's right now sitting on a, a tripod. Now, I don't actually do much with that C922 here at the office. Uh, I actually need to carry that home. That is actually a webcam for me to use at home if I ever need to, to record anything at home. I have it at the office right now because before I bought the G9 about a month ago, I needed to have two cameras for a video I did. I did a video about the uh, ZSA Plank Easy keyboard. And uh, of course I needed my standard camera on me and then I needed an overhead camera demonstrating the keyboard. And the overhead camera demonstrating the keyboard was actually the Logitech C922 webcam. Now, I don't like that setup, and the reason I finally bought a second Panasonic is because typically when I do those kind of two camera videos where I need two different cameras, the lighting really affects 
the Panasonic cameras, these mirrorless cameras, a lot differently than the Logitech webcam, the 922. Uh, the Panasonic's, I need to actually turn off all the overhead lights here, and, you know, and typically I just use the uh, Favatech LED lights, right? So it's really low lighting for the Panasonic mirrorless cameras. Well, that really low lighting sucks bad <laughs> on the uh, C922, so I'll end up, when I'm trying to record, two different cameras in the same lighting. One of them looks really good, one of them looks really bad. And then I'll adjust the lighting. I'll raise the lighting so that the 922 has enough light to work with. And then the Panasonic looks bad. So finally, you know, that's why I ended up buying a second Panasonic. And instead of buying a second G7, I went with the newer model G9. Let's talk furniture a little bit. I did buy this chair, my chair that I sit in on most of my videos. That is just a standard I, f I forget what brand it is, gaming chair, I bought on Amazon. It was on sale for like $99, this particular gaming chair that's black with some gray accents. And it's a very comfortable gaming chair. And it is a gaming chair. It has you know, some relaxation to it, right? It leans back. It's not the kind of chair like you would use at an office where you need to sit upright all day. That's more relaxing, sitting back watching videos, things like that. I do have a second chair that's more appropriate for office work. This chair here, which was actually in the office, it was provided with the office when I rented the office. And that's a, a standard office chair that's got more of a straight back. All the uh, desks in this office were also here when I moved in. I actually did not purchase these desks. I've got two desks. One is six by three, and the other that the Raspberry Pi is sitting on is a six by two desk. I've got them arranged in a L shape here, uh, just for sake of space. Behind me, that is a couch, a little small love seat. That is mine. I actually purchased that for this office, moved it in here, and I have the couch in here mainly to dampen the sound. Otherwise, the room would have a little bit too much echo. You see all the foam panels that I've got on all four walls. That was made by me and my sister. She helped me make all these panels. These are two foot by three foot panels and we put about, I don't know, 15, 16 of them around the four walls. And still, it was a little loud in this room. I've got curtains on the window. Still had a little bit too much reverb, you know, a little bit too much echo. Finally, adding the couch, it got the reverb and the echo down to what I think is a much more acceptable level. Now let's talk audio equipment because that's probably the most common question I get and eh, we've got a lot of audio equipment to cover. So the most common question of course is gonna be what microphone do I use? That's, uh, if I show you guys this tripod here that's swung away from my desk typically when I'm ready to record I just swivel that sucker around right here in front of my monitors and that's typically the shot you guys see. Now that microphone that is an Electro Voice RE27ND. And that microphone retails for about $500 these days. You can usually pick it up for about $500 just for the microphone. And I mean just for the microphone. Not the uh, pop filter, not the shock mount, just the microphone. The shock mount's going to cost you probably another $100. The pop filter's going to cost you, I don't know, I want to say that pop filter cost about $30 uh, for that particular one, you know, the little disc with the bar on it. If I can show you that. Uh, can I get that? Yeah. It's just a bar that fits in right there, clamps on. Yeah. And that, it, that particular pop filter, I believe, works on all the Electro Voice microphones, the RE20, RE320, the RE27ND that I use. And I think it also works for the Howl. Um, the Howl PR40, I believe, is the uh, uh, Howl microphone that a lot of people use. And uh, so you're looking at about $600 for the mic, pop filter, and the shock mount. Now I spent another $100, of course, on the scissor arm. That is the Rode PSA1 scissor arm. Probably the most popular scissor arm people use for microphones. Very sturdy. Uh, it's, it's just a really nice arm. Again, it's about $100. Now, other than that particular microphone, I do have several other microphones that sometimes I use on camera. Uh, I also have this microphone here. This is another Electro Voice RE27ND. So I actually have two of those really nice microphones. And that's why I have two of them is because they're nice. And I, I also wanted the ability to 
if I ever wanted to do anything collaborative with somebody else in this office, maybe an interview or anything like that, you know, I, I wanted to have two of the same microphones. It just makes things easier because it's going to sound exactly the same because I can set them up, you know, on my audio equipment, the compressor and the EQ and everything, and they'll sound exactly the same because they're the same mic. There's going to be no question, hey, what setting should I set for each microphone as long as they're the same. Now, other than the two Electro Voice 27 NDs, I also have a blue baby bottle. That is the microphone I'm currently using at home if I ever have to record at home. That's uh, like a $400 microphone from Blue Microphones, and it sounds really, really nice. It is a condenser microphone, the Blue Baby Bottle is, where the RE27 ND microphones are dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones are more appropriate for broadcasting for podcasting, or, or for anything you're doing inside a room that's not well-treated, that's not, not soundproofed. Because dynamic microphones, they don't pick up as much background noise. You have to be right on them, right? Where a condenser microphone will pick up noise from outside the room, across the street, you know, two blocks down. So the Blue Baby Bottle is not quite appropriate for what I do, but it's okay. Uh, like if I play with the gain enough, I can get it to where it doesn't pick up that much background noise. And uh, again, if I ever do anything from the house, you guys will see the blue baby bottle. It has the like round capsule. You know, it looks completely different than these microphones. Some other microphones I have, uh, we talked about this rig here. That's, you know, this all in one camera lighting microphone, the shotgun microphone that I have taped up here to not allow it to swivel around. Let me uh, unswivel it if I can. Now, we talked about the differences between dynamic mics, which are more broadcast type mics. They're quieter mics. They don't pick up as much noise. Condenser mics pick up much more noise. And then a shotgun mic, they're typically these longer tubes. They're condenser mics. They pick up noise and they have to be condenser mics because these are mics that you don't get upon. These are designed to be a few feet away from you. So typically, you know, it would be me sitting in this chair. I would roll that stand, you know, a couple of feet in front of me. And, you know, again, I'm going to have this microphone uh, on the tripod up out of the, out of the camera frame, but it's going to be a good three or four feet away from my mouth, right? <laughs> so it's got to be a condenser mic. It can't be uh, a dynamic mic. So it's going to pick up a lot more noise. There's going to be a lot more crud in the sound. You do have to clean up these shotgun mics a little bit. So I do usually have to do some post editing. So I'll, I'll you know, open up Audacity or one of the Audacity forks like Audacium or Tenacity, and I'll have to clean up some of the noise in it, but it's not too bad. Now let's talk about some of the audio server equipment. So I have a five foot tall server rack here that I've got various audio equipment. So let's start, well, let's start with the first part of the chain. So all the microphones plug into a preamp, this Netty preamp. And I've got eight channels in the Netty preamp. And you see, I've got two microphones plugged in right now. Those are the two Electrovoice RE27 NDs that I showed you. So I've got both of those plugged in. And from the preamp, they go into an EQ. Uh, both of them, I believe, go into the first EQ, which is a double channel EQ, so it can handle two microphones. And then they go into one of these uh, DBX166XS expander limiter gates. I have two of them. They are dual channel. Uh, I have two of the EQs that are dual channel. The, the EQs are uh, DBX231S, so between the two EQs and the two expander limiter gates, I can support up to four microphones, right? Because I've got eight channels in the preamp and then up to four channels in the EQ and the expander limiter gate. So I, I could power up four microphones and have them set to the exact same setting. So if I ever wanted to do a podcast, you know, like you, you've seen those podcasts where it's just a chair in the middle of a room with four microphones. I'd have no problem powering something like that up. I already have all the equipment for something like that if I ever wanted to do something like that. And then, so we go to preamp, EQ, expander, limiter, gate. Then the two RE27 NDs go into the, uh, this is a sonic exciter 
by Behringer, the Sonic Exciter. Basically, it, it, it excites the mid-ranges, right? Because the uh, RE27ND dynamic microphones, most dynamic microphones, because you're right up on them, they get what's called the proximity effect, meaning the closer you get to them, the more bass that gets picked up in your voice. And I've got kind of a deep voice anyway. So on the RE27NDs, you know, it's got a little bit too much bass and it sounds kind of dead in the mid-range. The Sonic Exciter can help, you know, liven up those middle frequencies to make it sound a, a little better to my ears anyway. The last part of the chain is this Mackie 12XX mixer. So all the analog equipment eventually gets worked into the mixer here, the Mackie 12FX where that analog signal, of course, is converted to a digital signal, and the digital signal then gets sent to the computer. So the, uh, the mixer basically plugs in via USB to the computer, and that's how the computer finally gets the sound that traveled from the mic to the preamp to the EQ to the expander limiter gate to the sonic exciter to the mixer, finally into the computer where OBS can recognize that source. And I'm going to provide links to all the equipment that I've talked about today. Uh, and of course, you can click on the links to find out the prices because I know I forgot to mention a lot of the prices. I mentioned some of the microphones. I mentioned the RE27NDs were about $500, $600 with the shock mount. The uh, Sennheiser MKE600 shotgun mic, that's about a $400 mic. The Blue Baby Bottle, that's about a $400 mic. This equipment here on the audio server rack... I want to say that the DBX EQs run you about $150 to $200. Of course, I got two of them, but you know, most people are only going to need one. The uh, DBX 166XS. I don't think DBX makes those anymore because I had a hard time finding the second one. I had to buy one secondhand off of eBay. But I want to say when I was able to find those, they run about $150, $200. Uh, and then the Sonic Exciter by Behringer, I want to say I paid about $100 to $150 for it. The Mackie Pro FX 12 mixer, that's about a $300 mixer. Uh, I forget what I paid for the 5-foot server rack, but that's a good server rack, heavy steel. I mean, it's built like a tank. I'm sure I paid two to $300 for that server rack because, uh, again, it's... It's really thick, heavy steel. It's, it's got rolling wheels on the bottom as well. And again, it's built like a tank. Some of the other stuff that you see in the backgrounds of my videos. Of course, I've got this bookcase behind me that you see various items on. Most of it are boxes that my equipment came out of, uh, such as the cam link. The cam link is actually what I use to capture video. So many people ask this. Hey, how do you capture video from your you know your mirrorless camera how do you get that into the computer well i get that into the computer via the cam link you see this big oversized usb stick that's actually uh plugged into a, a usb port but on the back of the oversized usb stick the cam link you can see it has a hdmi input for the hdmi cable that's coming out of the panasonic g9 i just plug that into the cam link and then the cam link plugs into a USB 3 port. It has to be a USB 3.0 port. And then OBS will recognize that as a video source. I've used the cam link now almost the entire time I've done the YouTube channel. You know, early on in the YouTube channel's history, once I switched from using a standard Logitech webcam to my first mirrorless camera, I bought the cam link. And uh, I wasn't 100% sure the cam link would work on Linux because back then there wasn't much information on it. But it worked perfect. And, and I, I tell everybody <laughs> that asks about, hey, how can I capture a camera on Linux? The Elgato Cam Link works almost perfectly. And now, it's not 100% perfect. Sometimes I will turn on OBS and, and it won't actually pick up the signal from the Cam Link. And typically what I have to do is turn the camera on and off and then close OBS, turn the camera back on, reopen OBS, and then it will pick up the cam link. So that's one minor annoyance, but for the most part, the video quality for the cam link is great. Now I do have a second capture device just in case I need it because sometimes I might need to capture more than one camera, right? And we've talked about this before. And I'm, what I have for capturing a second camera is this Magewell K2 
capture device. Again, it plugs into a USB port, USB 3.0 port, and then it has a HDMI connection on the back for, you know, getting the HDMI input from your camera. Again, this is a Magewell capture device. This thing was expensive. I want to say I paid like $200, $250 for the Magewell uh, capture card, and that was about three or four years ago. The cam link at the time I purchased it was like $100. I want to say I paid about $95 for it. That price has gone way up recently due to the pandemic, computer prices, peripherals, sky high. If you can find a cam link now, you're probably going to pay at least $150 for it. Other than that, most of the other stuff you guys see, I mean, you see like merchandise, you see like my mugs here. Let me see if I can get uh, some of this on camera. My, uh, By the way, I use Arch mug. You see I have my Ubuntu definition mug, which is the brown mug, my Manjaro definition mug, the uh, Debian stable Jurassic Park mug and of course i've got some of my other merchandise here if i look on my couch here that is actually my gym bag that i carry with me to the gym every day and then to the office but i do have a couple of extra shirts in it to change into if i ever record more than one video in a day for example here this purple shirt here i believe is the ubuntu definition t-shirt let's see if i can get that on camera there you guys have have seen this shirt I've worn that on video a few times. I've also got my uh, Bald by Choice shirt here. Let's see if I can pull that out for you guys. Bald by Choice. And then, of course, my, my thumbnail there. You guys remember that from a video I did. Bald by Choice. And then it says, but it was God's choice, not mine. Of course, we all know DT is not bald. And then the last thing I'll mention is I've got, you know, various little knickknacks. So obviously for all of this equipment in this room, you know, especially when I rearrange things or trying to do different shots, I need different cables, different lengths of cables. So on the audio server rack, at the very bottom of it, I've got two drawers. And in these drawers, I've got various cables. So lots of XLR cables, I've got USB cables, and then in the desk drawers over here in this bottom desk drawer, if I rolled it out, I've got um, Ethernet cables, HDMI cables, DisplayPort cables, I've got a million different cables. I've also got a ton of straps, Velcro straps to tie cables to like arms and things so to make things neater especially as i'm rolling these c stands around right once i get in place and get everything plugged in then typically i'll roll the cables up and then zip tie them or, or velcro strap them you know somewhere so that the cables don't look all crazy and so that i don't trip over them the last thing i have in a drawer here and this is really the most important thing in the second drawer here i have my keurig cups so this is, of course, Joe's brand coffee for my Keurigs. And you'll notice I also have two rolls of toilet paper. And then in the bottom drawer below that, I have uh, paper towels. And you're one, probably wondering, hey, DT, why do you have toilet paper and paper towels in your office? That's mainly for cleaning. Uh, it gets very dusty, especially around all these monitors. And it's nice. I, I've got some Lysol spray and some odor ban and you know some cleaning products as well also i mean having two extra rolls of toilet paper in a drawer like there is a restroom here at the office the suite of offices here but you never know i don't want to be dependent on someone else because i may come up here one day and really need to go and then i get in there and they're out of toilet paper hey you know what i've got my two emergency rolls just in case. So that was just a quick tour around the office, a quick studio tour. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know a lot of you guys enjoy these kinds of videos. I know many of you probably don't care. You're more interested in the content of videos rather than how they get made, right? You're not, all you want to do, you want to eat the sausage. You don't want to know how the sausage is made, right? But for those of you that, that do appreciate these kinds of videos, I hope you enjoy it. And we'll do it again, you know, a few months down the road as I buy more equipment, you know, it becomes necessary to do these updated studio tours. Anyway, peace guys.